Services and Firewalls. On a Linux machine, one of the questions you might ask is, what is a service? And then a related question might be, what is a daemon? So a service is basically some program or something that runs in the background. Something that serves requests and answers things and helps you work. So a web server is a background program that runs and when requests come in from the outside, it receives these requests, processes them, and then sends out pages and information. So that's a service. There's also other services such as a time service, which will sit there and periodically go and check to see what the time is, compare the time to its clock and update the clock depending on the differences. So that would also be a service. So then what's a daemon? Well, a daemon is basically, or a daemon, is something that operates in the background. So, basically the same thing as a service. So where did the name daemon or daemon come from? Well, there's this Maxwell's daemon thing where it just serves its master. So, which services do I want running? Well, that can be a tricky question. It depends on what you're doing with your server or with your machine. What you're running, what you need to run and how your machine needs to react. But there are some services that are kind of essential, not really essential, but kind of essential, such as the mail server. So all Linux machines, all CentOS 7 machines, have a mail server running. And the reason for that is not so they can receive mail, it's so that the other services have a way to communicate back to the administrator that something happened. So things like your cron jobs, your tasks, will send a message to the administrator when something produces output that's being run as a job. So the administrator knows something happened. So that's going to be useful. There are other services that keep track of things like if you're uh, doing uh, DHCP based addressing, your DHCP service needs to run in order to maintain and update your lease so you don't run out of IP addresses. So then the question is which services pose security risks? Well, any services that can be accessed from the outside or the inside pose a slight security risk. The more rights a service has, the more of a security risk that service becomes. Managing services. How do I know if a service is running? Well, on newer systems with a system D as the, well, the service or the system running the uh, machine, you can use the system CTL command for system control to check to see if a service is running. You can also use other programs to check to see which processes are on the machine and try to figure out if a service is running that way. It's probably easiest to use the built-in service checking utilities. So let's take a look at the system CTL control command. So we have on a default machine, a couple of services running. You can type in system CTL status, and that lists a whole bunch of stuff, which is kind of useful, but then you're like, well, what does all this mean? Many of these services you can see are running. You can see process numbers, what was used to start the services, and that can be useful. But let's say I want to look at a specific service. I want to know if the SSHD service is running. So I do system CTL status. SSHD. Right here I can see that the service is running. The green active indicates that it is running. So you got to make sure you can keep that straight. The active green right here says it's running. Then you might see this other thing, enabled. What does enabled mean? Well, enabled means that it is not just running, but it will start at boot time. You also see this vendor preset enabled also. 
So when you install the software, it assumes it needs to run, and then it's currently set to enabled. If I wanted to not start at boot time, I can disable it. And if I want to stop the service, I can stop the service as well. So let's do a check right here. So if I do system CTL disable SSHD, and now I look again at the status, I can see that it is still active and running, but now it says it is disabled. So it will not start on boot time. If I do a stop on SSHD, the service stops. So if I do a system check again, I can now see it is inactive or dead and it is still disabled. If I want to enable it, enable, and I look at it, you can see that it is enabled, but it is still inactive and dead. If I want to start it back up again, I just do a start. Now, one thing you might have noticed is when I disabled and re-enabled, what it was doing is doing something with symbolic links. You can see it created a symbolic link. So ETC, system CT, uh, system D, system multi-user target wants SSHD service. So currently my run level is multi-user target, multi-user. So in this directory, there is a list of symbolic links that include the SSHD.service symbolic link, and they link over to another place on the system, user lib systemd system SSHD.service, which is where the service scripts are actually located. So we'll be looking at that in a little bit. So, will the services be running after I root the machine? All you need to do is figure out if they are enabled. And you can change that using the systemctl enable or disable commands. And you can start and stop them with the systemctl start, stop, and you can use restart as well. So how does the system use the scripts? Where are the scripts stored? What is contained in the scripts and what does it mean? Well, so when you go over and you look at these scripts, so let's take a look over them. First, we'll go over to the etc directory, system d system, and then multi-user target wants. I can see there are a lot of symbolic links, and these links link over to my actual scripts and these are the services that start in older startup processes so we have a system d right now but before that we had init and init had this thing where each each service had a number and that number indicated the order in which it was started and so that was great you just need to make sure you know which number your service needed and it would start before things that required it, and it would start after things that it required. So you just figure out what number they had, and you put it in the right place. This is different. With System D, now it can look at the dependencies in there. So if you think about the SSHD service, what does it need? Well, it's a secure shell that you use to log in over the network. So what does it need? It needs to have networking working, right? So we cat out the SSHD.service. It shows us this is our open SSH server daemon. It's got some documentation information. It has to be started after network target and the SHD key gen service. So it needs to actually have a key in place. It wants the SSHD key gen service. And then it's got all these other pieces of information tells you things like how to start it, how to stop it. 
And that's all used by the system CTL command when it starts and stops things to make sure that things are ready. Also, when you're doing, uh, when you're enabling it and you're booting it from the beginning, it will take a look at these things and figure out which services need to be started in which order and calculate out that little tree and then start things in the order to make them work. All right. Next tab. How do I know if my services are really running? Well, we've started the SSHD service and system CTL tells me that SSHD is running, but is it really running? We know that the SSH service listens on port 22. So we want to figure out if it's listening on port 22. So let's go and take a look. So if I type in netstat, it lists all this stuff. And you can use different uh, letters. So I want to make sure I use my TCP and UDP and um, I want numbers instead of names and all of them. So I do tuna. Nestat minus tuna. And then I can see this right here. My SSH service is running on this right here, which is useful information. Because I can tell, oh, SSH is listening on all IPv4 interfaces. And it is port 22, and it's in listening state. I can also look at this thing right here, and it says it's also listening on IPv6 interfaces. It's so all of those, and it's in a listening state. If I want to see a little bit more information, I can add the P option, which will show me which processes are running these things. So I can see that the SSH service right here is using the SSHD process. And you can see the same exact process ID number and program name is running on the IPv4 version right there. So IPv6 and IPv4 are both running. They're both TCP. I don't see anything with UDP, but I can see other processes here that are running. And what's going on? So how do I know if there are any current connections? Well, there aren't any current connections right now, but if there were, you would see something about established connections, not just the listening. Because this right now is just listening, but no one's trying to connect to the SSH service. Nmap. Are my services visible from localhost? Well, that's an interesting question. So let's go back and take a look. So. If I do a yum install nmap, and I recommend nmap to anybody who wants to be a decent administrator. It was considered originally kind of a hacking tool because you can scan ports and things like that, but well, it's useful for other things too. So nmap localhost. And then it comes back and says, oh, when I did a scan on localhost, these are the ports that responded. So one thing you want to pay attention to is it says not shown and it says closed ports. So what are closed ports? Closed ports are ports that when I try talking to the ports, the kernel respondent said these ports are not open. And that means they got past the firewall. Then I got this thing right here where it says these ones right here are open. Okay, so SSH is open. SMTP is my mail service and it's open for at least a local host, so local connections. RPC bind is for some things like network file system and NIS, you know, some of these things. And then there's the printing thing right here. So IPP for your internet printing that is actually run by the CUPS service. Now, if I say, well, what's my IP address? If I do IP adder, you can see my IP address. It's kind of hidden in here, and it is the 10.0.2.15. So I want to scan that one. So to nmap 10.0.2.15. Since I'm on my own machine, you'd expect to see the same things, right? Well, 
Not quite. Some of these things are only listening on localhost. So the mail service, ProcMail, was only listening on localhost. And the print service was only listening on localhost. But RPC bind and SSH are both listening on the external interface as well. So what would I see from the outside? I would see anything that gets through the firewall. So SSH is currently getting through the firewall. That's the default configuration, but RPC bind would not get through the firewall. So externally, all I would see is the stuff getting through the firewall. So let's go ahead now and take a look at what a different machine would see. So I'll switch over to machine. And right here, I can use nmap to scan 10.0.2.15 and figure out what through it. So what we'd expect to see is the SSH service getting through. And that's all we see. Notice how it doesn't say closed ports right now. It says not shown 99 filtered ports. Hmm, that's interesting. So what does that mean? It means that the rest of them didn't actually send a response back. So that means there's a firewall. Scheduling tasks. How do I schedule tasks? Well, you can use the cron tab service. And there are different places you can look at for scheduling tasks. The most common is using the cron tab minus E option. So let's take a look at that. So clear this out. Let's go down to var spool cron Cron. So if I go to var spool cron, I can see in this there is nothing here. If I do cron tab minus e, it will use your default editor and you can go in and put something in here. So you can put in a bunch of different numbers. So if I want something to run every minute, I could do this right here and then I can type in some command. Now, one thing to keep in track of is that cron, when it runs, it does not necessarily run with the exact same environment that your user logs in and runs as. That means that file locations and executable locations might not match exactly. So, usually you want to pass in the, uh, not just relative, but the absolute path names for everything. So what I wanted to do, um, let's find a control Z switch. No, can't do that. Let's go ahead and leave a comment here and let's figure out what command we want it to run. So we write and quit. And if I type in a command right now, um, like, uh, LS, it tells me what's in my directory. And if I do which, actually that's the part of bash, huh? so which uh, let's we'll say it's really an alias. Um, but let's try this uh, user bin ls. So if I type in user bin ls and go back in my cron tab, cron tab minus e for edit, and then I for insert mode, type user bin ls, then I can write this and it will install a new cron tab. And if I take a look at my current directory, there's this thing called root. If I cat it out, you can see it is that text file I just edited. And now, I mean, I put it here in my var spool cron directory. Didn't have to put it here, but it does because that's where it puts all the cron tab files. It's not just because I'm in this directory. It's because that's where it puts them. So now it's supposed to be running every minute. So you can see that in about 12, no, in about 30 seconds, it'll run again. So then what were all those stars? I put five stars there. So I look at my cron tab. 
uh, information, you can see all this stuff here. It says, here you go. There's a bunch of stuff about using CronTab to get in here. If we want to see more information and actually see what these things are, we look at not the CronTab file, not the CronTab executable, but the information page. So I can do man5 cron tab. And now it will tell me the information about how to set up cron. So I scroll down and it says, okay, there are five fields. The first one is your minute field, which if I put a star there, it means every minute. If I put um, a number there, it would mean that minute. So if I wanted to run on the hour, every hour, I put a zero there. And then if I wanted to run maybe every day at midnight, I could put zero, zero and then three stars. Then I can limit things like the day of the month. I can pick which day of the month from one to 31. Some of these days of the month might not be hit. 31 might not show up for every month. So maybe you'll run things on the first day of the month or maybe some random day in the middle of the month. You can pick which month, one, one, 12. You can also pick the day of the week, which is zero to seven. So zero and seven are both Sundays. There's also other combinations. You can do commas to separate multiple different things and you can do slash things. I, I usually do things like star slash three for every three minutes or hours. And that can be useful. All right. So now if I look at my date right now, I can see that some time has passed. So the LS command should have run multiple times. So if I go over to my mail, bar spool mail, I can see there is a root file. And if I cat out my root file right there, I can see all the mail. And it's probably generating something, but maybe not. Sometimes when you have a cron job that runs, it produces mail. So just be aware of that. All right, so that's how you schedule tasks as a normal user or as the root user. There's also the etc cron uh, directories. So there's etc cron.d for your configurations, cron.daily, cron hourly, monthly, weekly. So if I want something to run every day, I can do cron daily. And in this cron daily, I can see that these three commands are running every day. It doesn't tell me when they're going to run, but they're running every day. And now it says I have mail in my root directory or root mail spool. So if I cut out this root thing, it looks like it is running again. And you can actually see this is actually output from the ls command. It's running in the root directory, and these are files in the root directory. Doesn't matter where I'm at right now. If I look at the root directory, I will see the same files, but it's running it slightly different. It's not running it the same exact way. But you can see how it's slightly different when it runs versus when I run it by hand. All right, so that's scheduled tasks. How do you know if a cron job runs? Well, you don't necessarily know if it runs if it produces no output. But if it does produce output, then you can see it right there in the mail. So firewalls. What firewall is used in my system? Well, it depends on which system you have, but it's changed quite a bit. When I first started using Linux, the Red Hat uh, distribution I was using had IP chains, which was later replaced by IP tables. And now we are in CentOS 7, which is a little bit different. It uses IP tables kind of in the background, but it really has Firewall D as a front end to it. So it uses kind of both things there. Firewall D is kind of a front end to manage it. But in CentOS 8, they are switch, switching out Firewall D and going to something different. So just keep that in mind. They keep changing the back end firewall. So 
FireOLD is what's used on my system, but you can use IP tables as well. How do I see the current firewall configuration? Well, you can use the firewall CMD command to look at it. So we can look at that, how to open ports and services, and figure out which services are supported and how I do a permanent service and what that means. Okay, so let's go back to my home directory. If I do firewall, wall dash CMD, no space there, dash dash list all like that, it will list which services are allowed through the firewall. This is the active current services getting through. You'll also notice, notice this is the public firewall rule. And we can see the SSH services getting through. And we know that was getting through because we already did an nmap. And we can see this DHCP v6 client service is allowed through, which means that if I'm running as a DHCP client, then I'm allowing responses from the DHCP server to come back into me and tell me what my IP address is. So that's important. Nice things to know. What if I want to add a service? So I do firewall CMD add service equals HTTP. So add the web service. It says it's successful. And I think, well, okay, that's great. But if I re reboot my system, it will no longer be in in my firewall because this is an active only change. If I wanted to be permanent, I would use a dash dash permanent. But let's take a look at what this does. Since I'm not running a web server, what if I jump over to a different machine and scan myself again? So I jump over here and I scan myself again. And I can see that the SSH service should still be open, but now it should say something different about HTTP. It says HTTP is closed which means that the firewall is open, but the service is not running. So keep that in mind. That's what that means. I should probably top, stop my cron job. So if you cron tab minus E, and I can just do D equal times and quit. There we go. All right. So, where are these rules stored and how does that all work well if i do i added the http firewall service if i wanted to get something else what do i have well i can do a firewall all cmd get services and that will list a complete list of all of the known services. So that's quite a few of them. So how do I make it all work? Well, I figure out which service I want, and then I have to turn on that service. What do these services do? Well, we can probably assume that when I turn on the HTTP service, it turns on the port for HTTP, which is port 80. And we probably saw that when we were looking at MF, we just didn't pay attention to it. So now what do we do? Well, we can now take a look at some more information here and see where does this actually get stored. So I take a look and we look at the user. Um, lib firewall D and you can see there's a bunch of stuff here and one of these things is the services directory so if I look in there I can see the exact same list of services but what does SSH do so I can cat out one of these services cat SSH and I can see it says that I'm going to allow HTTP, I mean, from when I'm going to start up SSH, it will do TCP port 22. If I wanted to look at something different like DNS, what does it do? Well, it does two different things. It does TCP port 53 and UDP port 53. 
So most queries when you're doing DNS lookups are UDP, but if you're doing a zone transfer, it does TCP. So you could modify this or change it if you wanted to, I wouldn't recommend it. Or you can also add new services here, just put in the information right here. So we can see what services are there. Now, what else do we have? If we look at the etc directory, there is a firewall wall D thing. And in here, there is zones and public. So there's a zones public file. If I look at this thing right here, I can see some information. It says that SSH and DHCP version 6 client are both listed in this file. What happens if I add something permanently? So I added the HTTP service. Now I do a permanent. And I look at that same file again, and you can see that it has been added to the file at the bottom. This does not make it active. It means that the next time the firewall service will start up, it will add that to the firewall. If I remove it from, the, from this permanent thing, so you do Dell service, nope, not Dell, it's remove. Remove service, it removes it from the permanent, but it is still in the active. So we do firewall CMD list all. I can see what is currently active. And if I want to see what is in the configuration file, I can look at the file or I can add the dash dash permanent to it and see what is in the configuration file. So you can see actively we have all three of these. In the permanent, we only have these two. So that's interesting to pay attention to and be aware of. So where are the firewall files stored? Well, we just saw that. Um, can the firewall be updated using the files? Yes, you can update it using the files. You might need to restart the service, but that's just you. And can you add additional services? Yes, you can. So you can go in there and just create new services. Just use the same file format and create them too. And that is services. Well, let's look at ports and then we'll be done. So I'll add over here. Let's say I want to add port one, two, three. What is it? I don't know, but we'll add it anyway. So we do firewall. We did add service equals something to add a service. And if you want to do a specific port, you can do add port. Then you to figure out what's the format. Well, you got to remember if it's TCP slash one, two, three, or if it's one, two, three slash TCP. And one of them will probably work. So you can try both and figure out which one works. In this case, I did the one to three slash TCP and I added it. It's not permanent. So if I restart my firewall, it will be gone. So let's take a look at that. So if I list my list all, I can see there is a port section and ports are listed. If I restart my firewall, So let's do system CTL, restart firewall D. And if I look at the same thing again, I can see the port is now gone. You can also do the remove port as well. Just remove it the same way you add the ports. And that is the end of this lecture.